Only tormented persons want truth. Man is like other animals, wants food, success, and women. Not truth. Only if the mind, tortured by some interior tension, has despaired of happiness, then it hates its life cage and seeks further. Robertson Jeffers, a dour Scot, but unfortunately you have another dour Scot in front of you right now. (laughs) Now, as I was preparing for this talk, I was having a conversation with a student. I was saying, I just don't know how I'm going to do this. And she said, well, why do you want to talk about this topic anyway? And it was such a great question. Because the reason this topic, this theme, there is no enemy, is important to me, is because I have fought with my life from before I can remember. Now, I don't know whether that's true for any of you. If it isn't, then everything I'm going to say right now is irrelevant. But if you fought with your life, if you fought with your experience, if you fought with yourself, then maybe something that I say in the next few minutes will have some relevance. So, probably the first time that I realized that this was how I related to the world it was in the middle of the second three-year retreat. Not the middle, it was actually fairly to- somewhat towards the beginning. And at a certain point, I was having a lot of difficulty, and my body said, Ken, you can go and get enlightened if you want. I'm not coming. Well, then I realized I had a problem. Now, not only am I a dour Scot, I'm also an extremely stubborn person. I didn't figure out any way to work with that problem for another 10 years. And then it was very, very much a case of clawing myself out of a very deep hole that I had no idea that I dug myself into. I came across a quote by Will Rogers, I think. It says, you know, when you're in a hole, stop digging. But some of us, these very straightforward wisdoms are very, very hard to learn. What makes an enemy? What makes an enemy is an experience that we can't tolerate or we choose not to experience. Something comes up in us and we can't experience it. Maybe we lack the skill. Maybe we lack the, um, the capacity. Certainly the case when we're small children. Maybe we lack the willingness. Maybe some combination of all of those. But we can't experience it. And so we're own, the only thing we can do then is to get rid of that experience. One of the ways that we do that is we suppress it but we don't really get rid of the energy of that experience. It goes into the body and makes us sick in various ways. The more common way is that we discharge the energy of that by expressing it. We react, in other words. And so, there is no enemy is a way of saying it is possible, perhaps, to experience everything that arises. What is an enemy? It is the projection of our rejection of our own experience. It is the projection of the rejection of our own experience. So when somebody, we encounter somebody in our lives, or we encounter a group or a situation, and we say, no, it's because something is coming up in us which we can't tolerate. And so we have to push that away. Or if we can't push it away, then we seek to destroy it, or neutralize it, or annihilate it, or whatever. 
This is what it means. This is how enemies come about. They all come because we cannot experience something. Now, what is associated with enemies is the emotion anger. It is the way the system energizes to push that away or destroy or overcome. Someone once pointed out to me that we only get angry at what we feel weaker than. And I love saying this to the CEOs that I work with. <laughs> it really, really bugs them. <laughs> that anger can be viewed a little differently. It can be viewed as the intelligence, our natural intelligence, if you wish, telling us that a boundary has been violated. In the same way that desire can be viewed as the emotion which arises when a connection has been broken. And when a boundary has been violated, we have a choice of two ways. Or let's say there are two possible ways. We don't always have a choice, because sometimes other things just take over. And those two ways are one is to reset the boundary and restore balance to the extent that is possible. And the other is to react, to express that anger, act it out, and this leads into, it's a reaction. It's based on the sense of self, largely the egoic self that Diane was just talking about. And it leads to the expression of anger, which often takes the form of revenge. And here's something rather unfortunate happens. When we act, react out of anger, in the instance of revenge, say, then we destroy something and we are marked by that act of destruction and we become what we set out to destroy. This is the mark of Cain in the Abrahamic traditions. It's, in other words, acting out of anger is a negative sum game. It's not a zero-sum game in which what I gain, you lose, and what you gain, I lose. It's a negative-sum game in which you end up worse than you were before. Well, what do you do with a negative-sum game? The only thing with a negative-sum game is don't play it, because you're going to end up. And this is historically what happens with revolutions. In most cases with revolutions, what replaces the regime is worse than, what, than it was before. It's a negative sum game because it's acting out of anger. A very concrete instance of this is with Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, the Oklahoma bombings. When Timothy McVeigh was executed, the family members thought they would feel complete. Justice had been done. The person that had perpetrated this tragedy in their lives had been obliterated, had been killed, no longer existed. But that isn't what they experienced. They experienced profound incompleteness. Something wasn't, there was no resolution. And this surprised them. And so a group of them got together and started to have a series of conversations with Terry Nichols, in which they talked with him about their experience. And they asked him, why did you do this? Why did you do this to us? And so there was a long series of conversations. And they came to understand something about each other. And through that process of reconciliation, they felt complete. And they could go on with their lives. And out of that was born a movement, which is still working, is called reconciliation, not retribution. And stepping out of the negative sum game. The purpose 
No, we are animals. We live, we die, we reproduce, we have a body. You can't get away from it. And we are deeply, deeply programmed or conditioned or have evolved, if you wish, any way that you want to look at it, to preserve life, to fight for our survival. You can't ignore this. What is the purpose of our practice? We hear all of these things about natural awareness and so forth, but in, from a perspective of evolution, then, the awareness that we seek to know and experience is anything but natural. It goes against our biological, psychological, family, education, cultural conditioning. And it takes a lot of work. Why do we practice? We practice to create other possibilities in our lives. And it's possible. That's the amazing thing. The genius of Buddha and many other sages over the years has shown that this is possible. It's possible to experience our life in a different way and out of that experience to actually act. We cannot control the reactions that come up in us. And a lot of people practice with the idea they're actually going to be able to control your mind. No, you're never going to be able to do that. But by practicing, you can open up other possibilities. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about with respect to there is no enemy. Now, my father once said, if you aren't out to change the world when you're 20, you're never going to amount to anything. How many of you are out here to change the world? Nobody? Yeah. I am. I have never grown up. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think all of us here are. We have that kind of idealism. And I think it's absolutely wonderful. But when we set out to, set out to change the world, we necessarily, almost naturally, un, almost unavoidably, move into an us versus them. Why? because we have a vision of what we want the world to look like. And it's different from how things are now. And so we want it to look like this, and here's going on. And so we almost think, OK, I've got to get rid of whatever is making the world like this so that this can happen. There's a little bit of a problem in this perspective. We have a vision. We're here in world A. We want to get to world B. But we're ignoring how world A actually is. And the only way we're going to get from world A to world B is through a process of evolution. So one of the ideas that I want to present here is evolution, not revolution. Now, this is much more difficult. You have much less control. It takes a lot more work and a lot more effort. People get impatient, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all very understandable. But everything uh, proceeds through a process of evolution. It can be faster or slower but it really is through evolution. And there are three things you're going to need here. A vision, a philosophy, and a community. Now, if you think about this, this is exactly the three jewels. Buddha is a vision. The philosophy is the Dharma. And the community is the Sangha. So I'm going to talk about each of these. The first one, very briefly. Uh, Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. And this is true, as true of Lenin, and communism in Russia, as it is true of mothers against drunk driving. And I want to talk about that latter example for a moment, because they proceeded through nonviolent means. Starting with the tragedy of a mother losing her 13-year-old daughter to a drunk driver, 1979 <laughs> or 1980. And she started this movement because up to that point, drunk driving was regarded as a slap on the wrist. That was the punishment for it. Not only did they get the laws changed, they changed society's attitudes to drunk driving, and they did this in one generation. 
And when you think about it, that is astonishing. To change the society, the attitudes of a whole society to drunk driving in one generation. So, a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens. What does the philosophy of no enemy actually look like in practice? I'm going to appeal to some important Buddhist themes, the principal one being the middle way. The first example is that the middle way says don't fall into an extreme. Extremes are dead ends. Therefore, everything has crystallized and is just solid. It, uh, it creates its own opposition. Nothing can move. And I want to give you an example of a person who has gone through some rigors of life, and here is how he views things now. I have come to see that we have an instinct for right and wrong and push it aside when it's inconvenient. That the more deeply we're motivated by emotion, the more insistently we pass it off as reason. That denial is a force to be reckoned with and our principal obstacle. That ethical codes are as likely to produce hypocrisy as goodness. That belief is precarious, especially when it demands certainty. That no religious, scientific, or academic faithful can be trusted that can't laugh at itself that the only way to respect truth is to take it with a pinch of salt, and that life leads nowhere until we consciously take the direction it provides. This is by a person that I've only met only recently, Stephen Chattini, lives in Montreal, uh, and uh, this is a, ch a paragraph at the end of his book with describing his experience as a, uh, becoming a Buddhist monk and then not becoming a Buddhist monk. <laughs> the second application of the middle way is embrace the differences. Another way of summarizing this is the tyranny of the or. Avoid that. Either this or that. That's what creates opposition. Black or white is what we say. But what happens when you take both black and white and embrace them? You get the whole spectrum of a rainbow. So by take, embracing both extremes, embracing the differences, you create a spectrum of possibilities. And there are far more ways to resolve difficulties and issues in your life when you have a color spectrum to choose from rather than just black or white. This is particularly important in conflict situations because conflict can only arise in a relationship it expresses a problem in the relationship. And the resolution of any conflict has to acknowledge the relationship that exists. And to acknowledge that relationship, you have to acknowledge that the, there is legitimacy to the other person's position. Diane was touching on this point in her presentation. But let me take you, ask you a question here. Opposition to gay marriage. Opposition to abortion. Opposition to immigration. What do these three issues have in common? Now, I've asked this question before, and I usually get Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, largely. And if I push a little bit, I get fear. And I say, yeah, that's true. But what these three issues have in common is they have to do with the viability of a society to reproduce itself. And there are a lot of people in this country who feel that this, the culture that they know is dying out. And they're, they're right. Because if you look at the reproduction rates of Western society, the US is the highest. You need 2.1 children per couple to hold a society constant in a population. The reproduction rate in, uh, in America is 1.68. In Japan, it's 1.16. These cultures are dying out. And so 
there is a very legitimate concern. And when you address that concern, then you can have a real conversation and not just be in opposition. So one way of stepping out of their, this opposition and this enemy thing is to really understand what are the vital concerns here. And the third and last point that I want to touch on is obstacles in your path should not be regarded as obstacles. They are simply features of the landscape which have to be negotiated. <laughs> now, in my consulting work, what I, you know, when I'm not a Buddhist teacher, I'm Moonlight as a management consultant. And there's a group that I developed at a, uh, one corporation I was working with, and they were always telling me, we can't do it because of X, we can't do it because of Y. And I would just listen to them and say, no, you haven't told me why you can't do it. You just told me, this is something that needs to be negotiated. You've got to work with it and figure out a way. You only t it only becomes an obstacle if you let it uh, negate your own intention and will. And Dogen has a wonderful thing to say about this. When you're talking with someone, do not try to convince them of your point of view. Rather, listen to them. Listen to them very deeply and help them to discover the errors in their thinking. And when you do that, you don't have to persuade them at all. They persuade themselves. And there are tools that I can give you which really help you to actually open up that dialogue so they begin to question themselves. They're not manipulative, they're just a way of being present with the other person. So, let me conclude here. The vision I would like to see is a world in which, to the extent possible, the institutions and systems that we need in such a complex society serve the needs of the individuals rather than vice versa, which is where I feel we are today to a large extent. The philosophy that I would espouse, there is no enemy, and the community, well, here we are, a group of thoughtful, dedicated, committed uh, citizens. Finally, how does this work? I only ever cared about the man. I never gave a fig for the ideologies unless they were mad or evil. I never saw institutions as being worthy of their parts or policies as much other than excuses for not feeling. I believe that almost any political system operated with humanity can work, and the most benign of systems without humanity is vile. The trick, I suppose, is to find the system that gives the least leeway to the rogues. The guarantee of our virtue is our compassion. And if you allow this institution or any other to steal your compassion away, wait and see what you become. The man is everything. And if your calling is anything, you will always prefer him to the collective. Because the collective is humanity's lowest and the collective is most often spoken for by people who are nothing without it. Now, where does that come from? It comes from one of John le Carre's novels, The Secret Pilgrim. He puts it in the mouth of his central character, George Smiley, on the occasion of Smiley's retirement from the British Secret Service. Well, if compassion is important in the operation of the Secret Service, then how much more important is it in the operation of our lives? And with that note, I will close. <laughs>